All right, we are going to spend some time in 1 John 1 verse 9, but also a little bit in context. So, first of all, just a reminder that we are in a fall series on the promises of God, a series of nine promises, and we've had the promise of his loyal love, we've had the promise of his presence, we've had the promise of his providence, and we are in the fourth one today, and the fourth one is the promise of his cleansing. And we're going to get a full-orbed understanding of what we're talking about in the Bible when we talk about cleansing. So cleansing is dealt with in 1 John 1 verse 9, which I'll read it again. You'll recognize maybe this morning in the morning service, we use this as our assurance of pardon or our assurance of forgiveness. It's a classic verse often used for this purpose and for good reason. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. Uh, So it begins with the big if. We're actually going to end our message today with the if. We're going to take the parts of this verse in reverse tonight. We're going to walk through it in three C's. His cleansing. And then his character, that's God's character. And finally, his condition. We're going to end with the if. But note that two, if we confess our sins, two assurances follow. First of all, he is faithful and just, first, to forgive our sins. And secondly, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, in the Old Testament, particularly in the, in the Psalms, you get, in, in, you get biblical poetry. And in poetry, a lot of times, you get something called parallelism or synonymous parallelism, right? Where you get two lines that say the same thing in slightly different ways. So as we look at this, maybe the question comes up, is this synonymous parallelism? Is to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, is this just different angles on the same thing? And I would argue no. And the main reason I would argue, no, it's not just a parallelism that we're talking about two separate things that God does is because this is not poetry. This is an epistle. This is a letter. And so, um, again, we pay attention to the genre, what kind of writing it is as we interpret things. So I think it's safe to conclude that we're hearing two different things here. In other words, two kinds of cleansing, two forms of cleansing are promised here when we talk about the promise of his cleansing. And, and by the way, I just have to say, my voice, I, I promise you, that my voice went bad the moment I stepped into the pulpit this morning. It was fine when I got out of bed. Like, this just happened. So I don't know what's going on. But anyway, I feel fine. Huh? Oh, is that what it is? Thanks for diagnosing. I appreciate it. All right. So we're going to, like I said, we're going to work backward, backward through the text of the three points. We're going to start with his cleansing. And just for fun, we're going to learn a little Latin. Okay? Ready for some Latin? Okay? This is, this, is, this is from John Calvin, who wrote in two languages. He wrote in Latin. And anybody know what other language John Calvin wrote in? French. That's right. He was a Frenchman. But uh, back in those days, the scholars all wrote in Latin. It was the Latin of theological scholarship. But there's a term, duplex. Think of a duplex. What, who lives in a duplex? Two, <laughs> two, right? Two households. Tuplex, gratia, dei. Say that ten times fast. No, don't. Duplex, gratia, dei. And it means the twofold grace of God. That God's grace changes us, that God's grace redeems us uh, through two main avenues. There's two main streams of grace that come to us that absolutely change us life, save us, and give us life, okay? And we can, we can characterize this, we can use t- just different word pairings to get at it. Some of these word pairings you'll recognize. Justification. Anybody know what justification is? where God declares, God credits the righteousness of Christ to us and declares us righteous, yeah? Okay? Even though we're sinners. 
Justification is one stream. All right? The other stream is what John Calvin calls regeneration, right? The renewal of your life by the Holy Spirit. Today, we would include sanctification, right? The process of being made holy, okay? Regeneration, sanctification, all right? We're going to put those in the same category. And in fact, in his, in his Institutes, Calvin kind of devotes one book to salvation, what God does for us in justification, and then another book to what God does for us in regeneration or sanctification. Twofold grace of God, all right? Oh, we can characterize this pairing in other ways to get at different angles of it. How about this? Redemption, being rescued from the wrecking ball, right? The old house. But after redemption comes, renovation. Don't leave the old house. You've redeemed the house from the wrecking ball, but if it's still falling apart, you haven't really done the given it the full works, have you? Yeah, redemption and renovation. Another way to think about um, the twofold grace of God is, first of all, what Christ does for us and what Christ does in us. How about that? What Christ does for us and what Christ does in us. Yes? Or we can think of it to sharpen that point a little bit. We can think of Christ's righteousness for us. Listen to um, Romans 5, verse 19 here. For as by the one, remember we talked about Adam and Christ? As the one man, by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. All right? So Christ's righteousness for us, but also Christ's righteousness in us. So the, the righteousness he credits to us, he now actually works in us. He makes us righteous people. And there's Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. All right, twofold grace of God. And here's another beautiful way we see these, these two streams of grace are actually laid out, most of the book of Romans lays out these two streams of grace. Romans 3 to 8. Romans 3 verse 5 um, gives us one stream. Romans 6 to 8 gives us the other stream. In other words, you read Romans 3 to 5, you know what you hear? In Christ, we are saved from sin's guilt. Romans 6 to 8, in Christ, we are saved from sin's power. Yeah, by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 3 to 5, we share Christ's righteous status and justification. In Romans 6 to 8, we share Christ's resurrection life from the inside out by the power again of the Holy Spirit, sanctification. Romans 3 to 5, in Christ we're justified. Romans 6 to 8, in Christ we are eventually glorified, made perfect and holy. All right, so... Now, there's another way to, to think about these two streams of grace in connection with baptism. I've decided to bring this in tonight because we just talked uh, about Colossians 2, 11 to 12 this morning with the, with the visuals here, which are partly dismantled, all right? And uh, Rome, uh, Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 69 and 70, lay it out beautifully. Baptism what it pictures is how we are cleansed. Here's the two streams. We are cleansed by the blood of Christ, but we are also cleansed by the spirit of Christ. It's another way to get at this teaching. Question and answer 69 of the Heidelberg. How does baptism remind you and assure you that Christ's one sacrifice on the cross is for you personally in this way? Christ instituted this outward washing and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away dirt from the body, so certainly, here we go, his blood and his spirit wash away my soul's impurity. In other words, all my sins. Okay? And 70 is going to unpack that just a little bit more. What does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit. First of all, to be washed with Christ's blood 
means that God, by grace, has forgiven my sins because of Christ's blood poured out for me in his sacrifice on the cross. Blood of Christ washes away the guilt of my sin. That's forgiveness. But secondly, to be washed with Christ's spirit means that the Holy Spirit has renewed me and set me apart to be a member of Christ so that more and more I become dead to sin and increasingly live a holy and blameless life. And there's renovation, sanctification, regeneration, the side of that ledger. So truly, truly beautiful. Yes, and there are other passages that, that lay out these, um, these differences. So, so again, to back up the catechism, listen to, listen to both streams of grace in, and cleansing in Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And there we see um, the cleansing as the sanctification or the renovation by the Spirit, right? But it goes on, it talks about Christ as the one who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. Now we get back to the blood of Christ washing away our sins. And then the last line flips us back to this side when it says, and to purify himself for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. All right. All right, and finally, finally, we see the whole purpose is a purified and cleansed and perfect and holy renovated person. Romans 8, 29, we see the full purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the end game, the end goal, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. All right. How does God accomplish this in us? Through the means of grace in the context of Christian community, the word, sacraments, prayer, right? Right? He does so also um, by speaking his commandments to us. As we hear God's commands in Scripture, the commands do two things to us. First of all, they're like a mirror. They show us our sin. They drive us to Christ for cleansing. But they're also a guide for Christian love and Christian living. Also, how does God accomplish this in us? The painful experience of conviction. No, conviction is not when a judge says, declares you guilty of a crime, but it's when your insides declare you guilty of a crime because the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes to see your sin for what it is. Recently had a conversation with a person who just said, uh, um, he says, you know what? I honestly, I have never felt guilty in my life. I can always justify everything I've done. Is that a problem? Like, well, <laughs> As you and your God need to have a conversation, and the Holy Spirit needs to get involved here. So, <laughs> it was a very honest. Like it was a very honest question. Like, how should I think about this? I'm like, yeah. So, right, we'll commit this individual to prayer. All right, um, absolutely. Conviction, testing, right? Testing is one of the the means by which uh, God cleanses us, as He puts a test in front of us. What is it? What is the purpose of a test in life? Well, why does a well-meaning teacher give a test? Right? A test, the purpose of a test is to show what you know, to show where you need to grow, to show what you know, to show where you need to grow. But the process of taking and writing a test will also cause you to grow as you study and learn, and you learn things through the pain of getting some red ink on the paper or having to do parts of the, uh, the physical exam <laughs> over again, whatever it is, right? So testing is one of the means that God uses to accomplish this in us. And then, of course, his discipline, right? His loving discipline. You know, those, who, uh, those whom the Father loves, he also scourges, he rebukes, and disciplines. So remember, this cleansing is a promise. You're in for nothing less. And we see those two parts of the duplex gratia dei, right? On the one hand, we just going back to our verse. If he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, the blood of Christ, and to purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that's 
the Spirit. Both of those are promised in just this one little verse. All right. Move uh, more shortly to the next two things. And by the way, remember, that's a promise. You're in for nothing less. When he redeems, when he pays too much for the condemned house slated for the wrecking ball, he doesn't just leave it as he is. He now renovates it, tears out the old, builds into new to make it a palace where he lives himself. And that's you and me. All right, we move from his cleansing to his character, right? Uh, Look at the middle line. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do those two things to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where do we anchor our certainty, our absolute confidence in this promise of twofold cleansing? In the character of God and who God is. It always gets back to the attributes, to the character, the unchanging character of God. And uh, our text, our little passage, calls him two things. Calls him what? He is what? He is faithful. And what else? He is just. Interesting. Of all the ones that uh, John could have chosen, he chooses faithful and just. First of all, he is faithful because faithful people keep their promises, right? He's faithful because he is faithful means he's a promise keeping God because he promised to do these things and he's faithful to his promises He will get it done. We can take it to the bank because he is reliable and faithful. Listen to Hebrews 10, 23, which uses the same word. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Okay, that one's easy enough. But what about just? What about just? Just means righteous. Okay? Our God is just. He is a just judge. And so at first it might make you scratch your head. Hold on, hold on. How how can a just judge forgive um, a guilty person? How How can a just judge take a guilty person and declare him righteous? Sounds like injustice. Well, the only way that it can happen is if he arranges for a substitute to take your place. Somebody has sinned, somebody has paid. Man has sinned, man must pay. So if a man stands in your place, shoves you aside and says, let me take the hit, let me take your guilty verdict, and let me be judged for it, yes? And then he takes the hit for you, so that you can stand in his place and receive forgiveness and get credited with his righteous life. That's quite a trade. I think he got the worst end of the bargain, didn't he? But because because a man stood in your place and paid for your sin, because every last sin in the universe at the end of the day is paid for, God can forgive you God can save you, God can cleanse you, and still be just because he has made sure that a man has paid for your sin. And that's what Romans 3 verse 26 tells us when it teaches us about justification, being declared righteous based on Christ's life and death in our place. Beautiful verse, it says, all this happened to show God's righteousness at the present time so that he might be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. But there's another sense in which we can look at God is just. Yeah, Just means righteous. When we think about God's righteous character, you know what righteousness is? It's to be right. Yeah? It's when you, somebody say, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah? Righteous means that God is passionate about right and he hates wrong. But it also means that God is passion to right everything that's wrong in the world. To take everything that's wrong and make it right again. And you and I are wrong. And he is passionate to take us and make us right again in every way. To make us right, forgiven before him, but to make us right and perfect 
inside out. It's his justice, it's his righteous character that makes him passionate to, to renovate us and, 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 um, and to make us right again, completely inside and out. It's rooted in the character of God, passionate to right all that's wrong, including us. All right? Again, every confidence we have is rooted in the character of God. He does these things. We can trust that he does these things because he is faithful and he is just. And he will act on that basis. And finally, the condition. We're going to just take a couple minutes here. There is a huge condition here. There's no way around it. These things are only yours. You only enjoy this twofold cleansing if, if we confess our sins. Yes. Let's look at the context of our little verse. Go a few verses earlier, 1 John 1, 5 to 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we step out in the light and we let God's holiness and God's truth shine in the dark corners of our hearts to expose our evil, to expose our sin, to put it on the table where we have to admit it, confess it, and ask God to forgive it and deal with it. That is what coming out into the light is. And when we do that, we have fellowship and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Also interesting is if you read the two verses, the sandwich verses around 1 John 1, 9, this verse here, both of them talking about, talk about how, uh, uh, if we deny that we sin or if we deny that we're sinners, we're a bunch of liars. And then we get this one right in the middle. So the context shows us these things. Here's another one that talks about um, the consequences of either concealing or confessing sin. Beautiful proverb, Proverbs 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Try to hide it, try to push it down, try to pretend, you try to deny, blame, shift, minimize, whatever you do to try to escape the, the, the responsibility for sin or even admitting your sin, it will not turn out well for you today or forever. Nope. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy, just like our text says. And finally, David, as he reflects on his own experience of the before and after of when he tried to suppress or conceal his sin versus when he finally confessed them. The experience of that, the two different experiences of those things. Psalm 32, 3 to 5, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Straightforward. James 5, 16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. All right. I think what we need then is a vision for confession, that confession brings freedom and life and fellowship, as we're promised here. And continuing confession of sin is part of God's ongoing process of cleansing. And so among other things in life, we need to keep praying for conviction. The Holy Spirit will continue to show us the grubby corners of our lives, the things we have not yet dealt with, the things that we are not dealing with, the things that we need to see that we have not yet seen as part of his process for growth. So his cleansing, his character, his condition, we've heard the promise of his cleansing, his twofold cleansing. Amen. All right.